Thank you all for having me today. Um, as Philip said, I didn't have a lot of time to put this together, so bear with me. This is going to be a lot more heavy on description and video than it is on interpretation and results at this point. Um, I'd like to at least begin by acknowledging our, collabor our main collaborators at MPG. Uh, Alan's been uh, real invaluable for helping to provide uh, insight into where different species occur on the ranch and uh, also sharing his uh, remote video camera footage with us. Uh, Joshua Lisbon has been a great collaborator in terms of uh, uh, extending the reach of some of the, the work that we're doing beyond the ranch and helping to involve some of the citizen scientists in the area. Uh, Bo Larkin has been invaluable for uh, helping to develop this uh, carnivore tracking application that I'll describe at the end of this uh, conversation or uh, this presentation. And Lorinda has been uh, working to develop the new non-invasive genetic sampling methods uh, for the lab and we'll hope, hopefully get there soon to be able to actually process all the samples there. Um, Anyway, uh, today I'm going to be talking about our three different main projects at MPG. These involve uh, black bears, uh, river otters, and mountain lions. The main objective of all of these studies is really to inventory and monitor the different populations in response to uh, ecological restoration efforts. Um, we chose to study carnivores uh, because they are apex consumers and they are ecologically important, but they're also in rapid global decline. Uh, removing these species tends to have drastic effects on other uh, components of ecosystems, so they tend to have a disproportionate um, impact on an ecosystem, so uh, they're very uh, important from that perspective. Black bears, mountain lions, and river otters are all game species in Montana, so there's an interest in conserving these species for sustainable um, harvest in the future. Um, and then these species all tend to be sensitive to fragmentation. Uh, they all have large home ranges, they occur in low densities, and they have very low reproductive rates. So all of these traits tend to make them sensitive to uh, anthropogenic caused fragmentation. Um, we use non-invasive genetic sampling methods to monitor carnivore populations at MPG because these have a number of advantages over traditional radio telemetry based uh, methods. Uh, the first advantage is that they don't involve any capture, handling, or drugging of animals, so we never see any mortality from the studies that we do. Um, we can identify individuals um, through these methods. We can determine their genders, whether or not they're male or females. Uh, we can estimate their relationships, and we can also collect data from a much larger area than we could if we were using uh, radio telemetry based methods. So I'm going to get right into the um, different population studies that we have going on, and I'll try to at least describe the, the main objectives for each study, talk about the methods, and maybe give you some preliminary results, and then we'll, we'll wrap each one of those studies up and move on to the next one. So for the black bear population study, uh, the real objective is to estimate abundance, density, and population trend of both male and female bears at MPG. A secondary objective of this project is to also document the grizzly bear presence or possible presence in the Sapphire Mountains. A couple years ago, we did have a grizzly bear uh, that made it into the Rock Creek area, which is obviously the, uh, the east side of the, the Sapphires. It's not that far um, as the crow flies to the MPG ranch, so it's highly likely that in the next few years we're going to start seeing some grizzly activity in the ranch, or at least in the Sapphire Range, and it would be real interesting to pick that up sooner than later. Um, and another uh, objective of the study is to estimate the relatedness and parentage of the different animals using the ranch. Um, after we get a multi-year data set, it'll be real interesting to look at whether or not um, the same animals that we see using the ranch um, in the future are the same ones that are related to the, um, the, the sows, especially the, uh, what did Alan call them, the maternal, uh, the matriarchs of the, of, of the ranch. So it'll certainly be interesting to see whether or not we see that turnover and whether or not we see a lot of uh, dispersal into the ranch as well of males. So the, the main method that we use uh, to sample the, the bears at the ranch is a method that was developed by uh, John Woods et al. 
1999. And this method basically consists of, a, of wrapping a single strand of barbed wire around a series of trees and you form an enclosure uh, by doing this. In the inside of this barbed wire enclosure, we bait um, the, basically a pile of, of debris uh, with a liquid lure. The liquid lure doesn't give any food reward. It's non-rewarding. It's composed of uh, cattle blood, rotten cattle blood, and rotten fish guts. It's real stinky stuff, and it's very effective at drawing animals um, into the enclosure. They step over under the barbed wire, which you'll see here in the next video, um, and then they leave a DNA sample, a hair sample that way, and we can do genetic analysis. Uh, typically, we set out these sites in a seven by seven kilometer grid. Um, so normally that might mean that there's one or two hair traps on the entire ranch. And then what we would normally do is move them around within a grid cell so that we're sampling multiple cell, uh, sites within a cell. Um, we went with a different approach at MPG because uh, we wanted to have a real high density of hair traps um, and basically try to increase initial capture rates as high as possible. And at that, um, we do have uh, the, the trade off there is that we're going to have lower recapture rates of certain individuals because they'll get habituated to the same sites over time. But um, because we're really interested in just capturing any individual that steps foot onto the ranch, we actually set out 12 of these hair snares. Um, in a, you know, over the 9,500 9, acre ranch. So that's a very high density of these sites uh, compared to what we would normally do. Uh, normally what we do is uh, we set out a site, uh, we bait it, and then two weeks later we come back and we check it for hair. And like I said before, we would normally move that site, um, but at MPG we're just rebaiting those sites and we're, we're returning to them time and again. Um, in 2012, we used this method, but we didn't get started until the very end of that year. Our funding didn't come through until the end of the year that year. So we ended up getting a little bit of a late start and setting out some of these traps in September and October of that year. They weren't as effective as we would have liked. Um, and part of that is because the berries are in and bears are just a little less likely to uh, respond to the smell of a carcass or to these sites. Um, also, we think that there's probably uh, uh, an effect of the actual quality of the hair samples where later in the year, as bears are preparing to enter their dens, their hair seems to be a lot harder to um, pull off. And so um, after they've gone through the molt, it just seems like those follicles are less likely to come out. So the samples that we even did get during that time of year weren't as good as we would have liked. Um, last year, we, we shifted towards uh, what would be a more normal sampling uh, season for these hair traps, and we actually ran those hair traps between June and August and had much uh, better success with that. Okay, so this is one of Alan's uh, remote videos of a bear, black bear coming into one of our hair traps. You saw it passed under the wire, snagged its hair, and now it's investigating the scent pile. Um, a lot of this remote video camera footage that we've collected over the years shows that the bears don't really spend very long in these sites. They typically spend one or two minutes um, investigating the scent pile. Again, it's not food rewarding, so they don't really have a reason to stay and they, they sniff it and they basically move on. Um, so I'm going to just go ahead and play this bear, this rub tree one while I've got it. Um, the next method that we use, which I'll describe in more detail in a minute, uh, involves these uh, bear rub trees um, that we identify for, rub, for hair collection as well. And this video shows a black bear vigorously rubbing on this tree, obviously. <clears throat> Okay, the next method that we used are uh, these bear rub trees. So this was a method that was really pioneered by Kate Kendall up in Glacier National Park. Uh, she published a paper in 2008 and 2009 detailing the use of this method. Um, typically, as I said, uh, we, we identify these rub trees. These are trees that bears are already naturally rubbing on. We don't put any bait on these at all. Um, we identify these trees by walking pretty much every trail in a given area and looking at almost every tree on that trail, looking for evidence that a bear's rubbed on it. It's either got bite marks or claw marks. Um, a lot of times it's been really smooth from years and years of rubbing. Um, and so once we've identified a bear rub tree, we can come around and systematically sample it every couple weeks for 
hair after we've set up little strips of barbed wire to act as collection devices. Um, so again, in 2012, we got a little bit of a late start, um, but did run the rub tree surveys between September and October of that year. Um, and then last year, we came back and did a much longer uh, rub tree sampling season that ran from early May until um, until November. And again, we greatly increased our success by running a longer season. So normally what we do is, as I said, look for different signs of wear. Um, this upper left uh, image shows some scratch marks. Here you can see some hair. Um, this is a real typical bear rub tree in the middle. A lot of times these trees are um, very uh, distinct from other trees. They tend to be offset or have something that distinguishes them as something that um, would be a natural marking post that would set their, uh, their scent off um, and uh, apart from other, other areas. I'm gonna skip that. Um, this map shows the, the 10 different uh, rub trees that we monitored in 2012 and the 12 different hair traps that we monitored. You can see we tried to get a pretty good distribution of the hair traps throughout the whole ranch. We never found any bare rub trees down in the floodplain, but if anyone ever finds any, please let us know. That would be a great area to increase um, distribution of the rub trees. Um, Alan, last year, to supplement some of our uh, rub tree, uh, the spottiness of our rub tree distribution, he actually added um, these railroad ties. He sunk them into the ground. Um, perpendicular, basically, these rub tree, uh, these railroad ties are soaked in creosote, and so that um, tends to, to attract bears and, and they tend to rub on these, uh, these treated posts a lot, very, very frequently. So uh, we added those posts to increase that distribution. Um, and he also added two uh, rub trees in Elk Creek or in Tongue Creek last year. So once we've got all the data um, after we've collected and uh, analyzed all of the genetic data and we actually have individual IDs and encounter histories built for every individual, we'll actually be able to go back through, build those encounter histories, and actually estimate different parameters using this data set. Uh, we can use Huggins closed uh, population models uh, in program MARC to estimate abundance. We can use spatially explicit capture recapture models to estimate density. And we can even use um, three different approaches to estimate population growth, including um, the seeker open population models, which are a new method that are, that are being explored. Um, the genetic analysis that we'll do on all of these samples is we'll run seven uh, loci, microsatellite loci, in every individual or on every sample to identify individuals. And then once we've identified an individual, we'll run 13 additional loci so that we can look at um, higher resolution questions of whether or not their relatedness, um, whether or not bears are related to one another and what their relationships to each other is. Um, we'll use programs Parente and Service to do the parentage analysis, and we can look at genetic structure using program genetics, um, which uses what's called factorial correspondence analysis to look at differences in a multi-locus genotype. Um, and then we'll also use program structure to determine the number of populations, assignment tests, and to detect migrants in this population. So, so far um, in 2012, as of the end of 2012, we actually uh, collected uh, four of our 12 hair snares had hair. We're still compiling the results from last year, and once we've got the, uh, once Lorinda's finished the genetic analysis, we'll actually be able to do some more of what I'll show you here in the next few slides, which is really compiling um, maps of, of different individuals and where they were actually detected. Um, Either way, uh, we collected 13 samples that year. Six samples um, from that first year yielded uh, individual identities, um, and we identified to five total bears from the hair snare samples. Uh, four of those were males, and one of those was a female. Uh, the rub trees did a little bit differently. Uh, seven of 10 rubs actually produced hair. We collected 22 samples um, that first year again in 2012. Last year, I think our count was 100 and about close to 168 samples, I think, total. Um, so we greatly increased our sample size uh, from one year to the next. And that's typical. We, we see that um, rub, rubbing rates tend to die off in the fall. Uh, there tends to be a real peak in rubbing activity in June and July. And then as the barriers come in, um, they tend to settle, settle down and not be rubbing as much. Um, in that data set, we identified uh, three bears. Uh, two of those were males, and one of them was a female. S uh, so 
the difference that we saw between the different sampling methods has been re reported in a number of studies, including a research that I did in Banff. Um, and so these figures actually show the breakdown of detections by either they were detected with a hair trap, with bear rubs only, or with both methods. And what we found was that um, in Banff, very, very few individuals Black bears were actually detected with bear rub trees, and by far the majority of them were detected with hair traps. Whereas with grizzly bears, we saw a bit of a different pattern, whereas a much higher proportion of them uh, were detected on the bear rub trees. Now this is actually in contrast to data for black bears that was collected in even Glacier National Park up north. And they actually just published, um, my business partner Jeff Stetz just published a paper in the Wildlife Society Bulletin, and they actually showed that rub tree detection rates were really high for black bears. They had about 50% um, detected on one method versus another. And so what we're really curious about, especially here on the ranch, is whether or not the detection rates could even be higher for black bears at rub trees than they would be with hair traps. Um, the two studies that I just mentioned um, that have been established actually have some Patrick populations of black bears and grizzly bears, and it's believed that there could be some competition going on there, some interspecific inter competition um, going on there to exclude the use of, of rub trees, whereas obviously at, on the sapphire, um, uh, in the sapphire range, we don't have a documented presence of grizzly bears, so um, black bears seem to be free to, to rub at will, and, and they sure seem to do that at the ranch. So it'll be real interesting to see if these patterns hold once we've gotten last year's data back. So to recap, these are all the different sampling sites that we sampled in 2012, and I just wanted to go through real quickly and show you the different detection um, Detec detections for each individual that we detected that year. So this was the one female that we detected. Um, and again, we only detected one female with the two different sampling methods, and we detected six males. So we had a very biased, male-biased sample, and part of that was probably because uh, males do tend to be picked up on the rub trees more frequently, and we had a little bit better uh, sampling coverage with the rub trees. Um, but this, you can see, is uh, all the detections for uh, bear female one. Uh, she was actually detected at a hair trap here uh, that isn't showing up, uh, but you can see that we'll be able to put together maps of the exact date and location where each of these individuals was detected. And she was by far the, the most detected bear that year. A lot of the bears were detected just once. You know, we've got one male detected in October at this site, another male detected in September at this site, another male detected this site, one male detected at two hair traps um, on two different days here. Um, but you can see that a lot of the bears are picked up on the periphery. So a lot of these bears are probably not spending necessarily a lot of their um, time on the ranch, but because of the nature of our detection methods, they do get picked up. Here's another individual where it's just detected on rub trees. And you can see that some of the individuals are just detected on rubs, some of them are just detected on hair traps, and by using both methods in combination with one another, it gives us a much more powerful and comprehensive view of the population. One last one, and that's it. So let's move on to the river otter uh, study. So the main objective for this um, study is to develop what are called single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, these are just single, um, single base pair regions of the genome that have variability. And the advantage, one of the advantages of using uh, SNPs versus microsatellites is because it's a much shorter fragment. Lorinda discussed yesterday about some of the difficulties of genotyping um, non-invasive samples and having really poor quality DNA or um, really uh, low amounts of template DNA to amplify. Um, SNPs are, aren't going to be as subject to this issue because you've got very, very small fragments to analyze, so the odds of that fragment actually being degraded are going to be lower than when you've got a larger fragment to amplify. Um, and then the other uh, thing about these SNPs is that they're very easy to score. And so um, Lorinda was explaining a little bit yesterday about how difficult some of these peaks can be to score. It can be a little bit subjective trying to call, is this the actual allele size or is this? Um, these SNPs are very easy because you just have four different potential copies. You get an A, a C, a T, or a G. That's it. There isn't a lot of size. There's no size um, polymorphism or anything like that. So um, potentially these SNPs have real um, 
applicability with non-invasive genetic sampling studies to, to increase the, uh, the potential to, um, to get data basically out of very poor quality samples. So um, we're very excited about this and I'll explain a little bit where we're at with that. Um, the other uh, objectives of this study are to estimate the abundance of riv river otters at MPG and to estimate the relatedness and parentage of individuals that are using the ranch. Um, so the North American river otter um, is a managed and sometimes controversial species uh, and monitoring populations is a high priority because their distribution has greatly uh, been reduced over the years. Um, they are aquatic, far-ranging species who ha exhibit behavior that makes research and monitoring very difficult because they're in the rivers, slipping in and out of the water, um, they're very difficult to census by most methods. Um, so the use of latrines um, that make spring collection um, actually feasible is a very logistically desirable goal. And so that's where we're focusing our non-invasive collection efforts on is actually identifying these latrine sites where uh, river otters are repeatedly uh, depositing their scat and um, urine and we're able to identify those sites and collect scat and ideally use the SNPs um, to identify individuals. Um, to date, genotyping has been very poor with microsatellites. We're talking between 5 and 25 percent of samples yield usable DNA. So you can imagine that that's pretty low and, you know, if you're going out there and collecting 100 samples and only five of them work, you're going to be pretty bummed. That's a lot of work. Um, so by increasing the ability to get genetic data out of the samples, it could greatly make these things more efficient, the methods themselves. Um, SNPs could potentially triple this rate, making, making um, non-invasive genetic sampling a much more um, feasible alternative. And, uh, uh, okay, oh, so uh, to do this, we actually collected, to develop the SNPs, what we needed to do was to collect tissue samples from all over um, otter range, uh, occupied river otter range. And those stars show at least a basic idea of exactly where we were collecting those tissue samples. We collected 132 tissue samples from agencies in 12 U.S. states and Canadian provinces. Um, we were trying to get as broad of a distribution of these samples as we could because knowing that, for instance, um, these markers work in one given population or even within Montana isn't going to be as effective as knowing these markers work throughout all of North America. There's a lot of times when um, alleles will be fixed in certain populations, so they might not be very informative at all. Let's say, uh, let's say we, we just got samples from Florida, well, it, there's a high likelihood that those samples or those loci that we identify um, from that population might not be variable in other areas. So by getting a broad distribution of these samples throughout North America, we're going to identify these loci that are highly variable across the entire range and that'll make them that much more useful for us. So we were able to collect tissue samples from all over these different populations. Um, you can see in Alaska we got one sample, 12 samples from the Yukon, five from BC, five from Idaho, 31 samples from Montana because we're collaborating with Fish, Wildlife and Parks. Um, Wyoming we got one sample, one from California, 41 from New Brunswick. Um, so you can see we got a pretty good distribution of samples throughout North America by doing that. And the reason why we target tissue samples is because those have very low um, rates of genotyping errors. There's very good DNA, quality DNA in there, and that um, is much more desirable to actually de do the, the SNP development on. Um, so this figure shows a, a zoom in of the actual um, sample locations that we were able to get tissue samples from in Montana. Um, and this shows the 31 different site or th the sites where the 31 different samples were collected. And you can see we also got a very good distribution of samples in Montana itself. So what we want to know is whether or not these markers that we're going to develop on the Bitterroot are going to work down on the Yellowstone River and work throughout river drainages throughout all of um, Montana. I'm going to skip that, but uh, so right now what we're doing is we're currently looking for um, scat and, and hair samples to assess whether or not the SNP marker performance is different 
um, with different sample types and whether or not the SNPs actually perform better than microsatellites. So the idea is that once we've gotten a bunch of um, scat samples collected, we can run the microsatellites on those and we can look at the amplification rates with microsatellites and then we can compare those with the SNPs and see whether or not the SNPs do indeed increase um, sampling efficiency and uh, amplification rates. So this shows um, uh, one of the guys that we went out with last year who helped us identify some of these, uh, these uh, sites where otters are coming in and out of the river to use these latrines. Um, and then over on the right, you see some of these slide paths where these otters are coming in and out of the river. Oh, I'm not gonna be able to show that. <laughs> So this is some of Alan's uh, remote video footage of, of otters using one of these latrine sites. And you can see that they dig in the ground, um, they defecate, there's like oily, um, <laughs> oily poop that comes out and they roll in it. So to date, uh, we've, we've done at least four surveys uh, to look for river otter scat. We found at least two active latrines, although I think Gus has found one or two more. Um, and we've collected at least 12 different scat samples. We're gonna increase the, scat, the sample collection next winter. So our goal right now is to get the SNP markers developed. Um, hopefully by the summer, publish a paper um, describing the SNPs uh, that we've developed and then next year hit it hard to actually do the sampling and to do the comparison with the different methods. So the last study that I wanna talk about is the mountain lion study uh, that we started a couple years ago. Last year in 2012, um, we basically just did a, a pilot year to see whether or not this would even work on the ranch and it worked very well. Um, so this past year we actually ramped up the sampling uh, intensity quite a bit and Joshua will hopefully would describe um, the more the details of that sampling. Um, but the basic objectives of this study are similar to the other ones where we're gonna look at abundance, density, and population trend of um, these carnivore species in relation to the uh, ecological restoration efforts. We can also estimate relatedness and parentage to determine uh, the relationships and the degree of phylopatry. And we can look at uh, predator prey dynamics over time and maybe even document carnivore presence of other species in the sapphire range while we're at it. So the main method we're using for this study is a method that I developed in Yellowstone National Park um, which basically involves uh, following a set of tracks in snow back to a bed site or to a natural hair snag. Um, that first study that we did, we found that um, most of the time we were trying to actually find bed sites. Um, and when we found a bed site, it had ample hair. We could pick hair out of it all day and it had great genetic material. But if we were also really careful observers, we could find hair that um, was on natural hair snags. So this would be a cat happened to brush up against um, a rose bush or a branch tip or a rock outcrop. And when it does that, a lot of times it leaves hair on those areas and we're able to, you know, if you're real careful and look uh, you can find those hairs and we can do genetic analysis on those as well. Um, we can also look at habitat use um, by doing some of the tracking work and I know Bo was doing a bit of this uh, up at MPG North with some of his tracking surveys and we can also get at some pretty good in, uh, predation information about what, what they're killing and eating. So this is a map that I created for this year. Um, again, last year we went out and we did a couple surveys very opportunistically. Um, it wasn't rigorous, it wasn't systematic, but at least showed that we could use the method on the ranch. Um, this year we developed what are called zones, different tracking zones, and these were based on elevation aspect, um, accessibility, 
uh, and also similarity in habitat. So uh, what we did was we overlaid four um, main zones over the mountain, over Mount Baldy, and then we called the, the river bottom basically its own zone. And what we were trying to do was visit a zone um, every week. We tried to visit every zone um, each week and tried to survey at least two kilometers in each zone every week so that we were stratifying sampling effort across the ranch um, and also um, trying to be systematic about it. So this was a video that um, Alan and Joshua and I actually got last year. We went out to do one of our track surveys and um, that cat had actually walked through um, uh, Whaley Draw that morning and we ended up finding those tracks unbeknownst to us. We didn't know it was caught on the camera at that time, but we ended up getting on those tracks and following it to a, a hair sample. And it occurred to me that, you know, these are, um, and then we looked back later and we found that the remote camera video and we said, oh wow, that's really cool. Um, but what occurred to me by, by seeing how those things tied together so well was that it would be possible um, to potentially use a method where we could increase the sampling efficiency of these non-invasive genetic sampling methods by utilizing this real-time information. So um, it occurred to me that we could use Buckeye cameras to do this. We could also use what are called cellular enabled cameras. These are newer cameras that basically just have a cell modem built into them and it sends a picture or text message right to your phone right when it happens. So in real time, you'd be alerted, okay, this cat passed through here. So um, obviously one of the main limitations to these non-invasive genetic sampling methods is just um, efficiency. It takes a lot of time to find a good track. It takes a lot of time to just be out there in the landscape. And a lot of times you don't find anything. So if we could have real time notification that something actually happened, it would help us to both target um, those days, be, you know, go out in response in real time, and we would also be able to collect better DNA samples. And so I ended up developing a proposal and getting some funding um, to pursue this idea across some multi multiple study sites with MPG Ranch will be one of them. Um, but I want to test two main hypotheses with this, and that's um, cellular enabled cameras will increase non-invasive genetic sampling uh, efficiency. And the second one is cellular enabled cams will improve DNA amplification success rates. Um, one of the things that I noted when I did the study in Yellowstone was that almost every time you were able to find a good track, you could find a DNA sample. Really your biggest limitation was you needed that fresh track. But if you didn't have it, you weren't as likely to find something. But when you, found, when you had a good track, it was almost 100% of the time you could get a DNA sample. So by having this, um, this, the power of these cameras to alert us to when these detections are going on could be, could be really beneficial. And obviously there's a big investment in terms of um, the cameras themselves and it might not be practical um, to use Buckeyes, let's say, everywhere. But certainly if you, um, you know, if you established a network of these sites in an area of interest, it would certainly increase sampling efficiency and it could be something where agencies could go out and they would have a whole series of these cameras that maybe they rotate around um, through different studies and increase their own efficiency that way as well. I'm going to end, more or less, talking about scrapes. Last year I made a plug that I was really interested in finding mountain lion scrapes on the property um, because one of the ideas I have is that if we were able to find some scrapes, you could put little bits of um, cotton or wool or something in the scrape itself to act as a, a DNA collection device. Um, animals urinate in these, so I want to show you this is a cat using one of these scrape sites. So typically cats communicate by going under a big tree or under a rock, and you see this really typical um, behavior where they take the back feet and they kick up the duff, and you see these very two very distinct um, parallel lines basically where they uh, where they're doing that activity. And a lot of times they're urinating or defecating in that area, um, and that's a mark, that's a scent mark. And so if we can identify these sites, it would be really valuable to increase our sampling efficiency for one, and also explore the idea of whether or not we can turn this or exploit this behavior as another uh, non-invasive genetic sampling um, method. 
So, and these are areas where there's a lot of different species coming in, investigating um, different things. There's a cat uh, exhibiting what's called the Flemin response, which is um, tilting its head back and uh, getting the, the scent to um, pass through the, the Jacobson's organ. I'll bet um, Tor would be able to explain that very well to us, what's going on there. So again, if we can identify these scrape sites, I'm going to keep going on this because I really want to sell this. I want people to find scrapes if they can. Um, we, we have not been lucky to find any uh, cat scrapes on the property yet, but if we could, they could potentially be gold mines for interactions between species and even intraspecific interactions. Um, this is a remote video that we got this year in Yellowstone showing a female investigating one of these scrape sites with her kittens. And that's interesting in itself, um, but what gets more interesting is that she exhibits the Fleming response, and then her kitten. So then the kitten mimics it, which is really interesting. I mean, we've seen similar behavior at these rub trees with bears where a female bear will rub on a rub tree and then the little cubs will come and rub on it as well. And it's, there's certainly some social learning going on here and you know, um, teaching the offspring how to basically communicate with other members of the species. Last one. This is another scrape site, and I mentioned that if we find these, these can be real gold mines for documenting different interactions. But this was a remote video we got from Yellowstone just a week or so ago at one of these scrape sites, and you see a very big grizzly bear comes in and investigates the area. And he actually ends up spending like four days bedding on and off of this scrape site, um, just kind of coming and going. And it's definitely curious because one of the things we documented in Yellowstone was um, sometimes bears will actually get on a track of a cougar and follow it to a kill. And sometimes they'll just stick with a cat and go from one to another another. So it's interesting. It makes me think, is it just sitting there waiting for a cat to come by? Or um, it, it's surely curious that it stayed in that particular spot. It was probably just a good bedding spot, but it was, um, it might not be coincidental. So anyway, enough of the scrapes. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the results that we've gotten so far uh, are that we've conducted over 20 um, surveys to date. Uh, Joshua's gonna get more into the details of exactly what we found this winter and how we involved the um, different citizen scientists in this project. Um, but more or less what we found was uh, we collected over 20 hair samples and at least two scats this year and we found a couple um, deer kills as well. So um, where I want to end this is that all of these uh, different projects are sort of tying in to a bigger goal that, that, uh, that we've been developing, which is to um, develop what's called this carnivore monitoring application. So um, for many years, I've wanted to streamline data collection, make it more simple, make it easier. Um, and fortunately, uh, some of my goals have, have dovetailed with the, the goals of MPG. And what we've been able to do was to develop a FileMaker um, Pro database to house um, data collection forms that we've developed over the years. Um, the, the pro version is actually the relation, relational database that will live on the desktops. And then what we use is FileMaker Go, which is the mobile version um, that lives on different devices, iPhones and iPads. And that'll actually be the input, the data input um, device that we're gonna end up using. Um, but one of the main advantages of this is to just improve data reliability, to force people in the field to put data into boxes and instead of making guesses or scribbling notes, um, to force them to enter data in a very systematic and reliable way. Um, it also helps to standardize data collection. Um, we're hoping to um, 
disseminate this, uh, this application to other carnivore monitoring studies so that um, we can have standardized data collection across a much larger area. Um, we have a huge problem in the carnivore world where everybody's got their own data sets, everybody collects it their own way. I'm sure it's the same with a lot of different um, species, but it's a huge problem and certainly by combining different data sets and doing meta-analyses on much larger areas and much larger sample sizes, we'll be able to get a lot more inference out of the, the data that we do collect. Um, and we can also eliminate data entry and transcription errors. So um, when we come out of the field, instead of having to enter the data, automatically we'll get it set up so that it can sync and you don't ever have to even do that step. Um, and then the other really nice thing about this is that we're able to um, catalog a lot of different photos. So um, every single natural hair snag uh, that we find, every kill, every track, we can document all those photographs. And as you guys all know, a picture is worth a thousand words. And to be able to go back and to actually look at those photos and to be able to um, discern patterns is going to be incredibly powerful in the future. Um, and a couple of the disadvantages, though, that we noticed this year, that there are some bugs that occur in these databases. I'm sure Bo could tell us all about them. Um, and they are uh, fragile electronics. We had an iPad in Yellowstone get cracked um, this winter, even with just regular use. So um, obviously there's disadvantages, but I think the advantages tremendously outweigh them. So just real quickly, I was going to at least show um, what the, the application, the main form of the application looks like. I realize you can't read much of this in the, in the back, but at least it gives you an idea of visually how we're, we're trying to record data now. So the top part of this form is a general um, repository for all things that have to do with a given survey, the date, very basic information that's going to apply to anything. And then we come down and we enter observations as we record them. And the way I envision this is that this is going to be a real good way to provide a narrative for what exactly is going on in the field. Um, one of the things that we found in Yellowstone with that past study was that um, we document, we actually collected hair samples from individuals from bed sites who turned out to have been dead. So meaning we knew that because every individual in that population was marked with a radio collar. Um, and what happened was the crews went out and they collected hair samples from these, um, these caves more or less. And those caves were protected enough that the DNA stayed viable and amplifiable. And even though those individuals weren't actually running around on the landscape anymore, they died a year before we were actually you know, still getting genotypes from them, which is a pretty scary thing. So I really, it, that was something, that fact made me really want to concentrate on developing better methods to document what's going on in the field. We need to build better narratives for what we find and exactly what's going on. And I think that this goes a long way towards doing that instead of just having you know, a description of that cave or for instance, now we've got pictures that show, is this actually snow covered? Is this, uh, do we have tracks that actually lead right to the, to the cave entrance? That sort of thing. So I think this is gonna actually um, go a long way towards improving these methods. So the future direction um, for the black bear study is to finish the genetic analysis and to search for new bear rubs this year and to implement some systematic scats uh, sampling this, this summer. For river, river otters, we're gonna finish developing the SNPs. We're gonna continue to search for latrines and hopefully implement some hair snaring next winter. And for mountain lions, we're gonna summarize the 2014 surveys when we're all done here in a week or two. Uh, I would like to keep searching for scrapes. And again, if any of you guys find anything even that resembles a scrape, please let me know. Send me a UTM. That's plenty sufficient. I can always go out and investigate it myself. Um, and then I'd like to continue to catalog predation events and build a, a database uh, of, of prey. Um, with the data entry app, uh, the future direction for that is to continue its development. It's got a long ways to go. I would say this year I got out, we got out into the field what I would call a prototype database. Um, it was usable, but it was certainly not ideal. I'd like to work closely with uh, Bo to continue to do that. He knows a lot about FileMaker development, and um, I'm more of a Microsoft Access person that's trying to transfer over. So um, he's been a big help to helping the learning curve with FileMaker. Um, I'd like to add new data forms into that application. So right now it's really focused on carnivore tracking and snow tracking, but what I envision is an actual application that we can use for hair traps, rub trees, 
Um, just simple opportunistic sightings. You could use it for any type of um, carnivore monitoring work and you'd be able to have it all live in one place. Um, we would also like to implement real-time syncing and this is something that Nick Franchak and Bo and I have talked about a bit um, in trying to get it so that the actual iPads are syncing either via the cellular network or some type of real-time syncing going on so that you don't ever even have to go through a step when you get home. Um, and I'd like to continue to um, uh, transfer this technology to other studies. Um, we've got the Yellowstone study I've mentioned a number of times now. Um, Alberta is actually about to implement a huge DNA sampling study next year um, where they're going to survey the entire province again for using rub trees and hair traps. Um, I've got a number of biologists that would be interested in potentially picking up this um, application and using it if we can get it developed by then. And uh, where I really see this going and having a lot of um, value is citizen science. If we can make this application um, take out some of the guesswork and eliminate some of the unreliability of data that's collected by people that aren't as trained as others, then I think that it would be a really powerful tool to be able to send people out into the field and collect data. Um, and then the, the non-invasive genetic sampling, uh, coupling non-invasive genetic sampling methods with cell cams, the, the future direction for that is to finalize the study design, pick out exactly how many cameras we're going to use, and fine-tune that um, to analyze the data, and then to hopefully come up with a publication. And with that, I, there's a lot of people to thank, but especially Philip for um, all of his support, Tor, Tor's been invaluable, and all the MPG interns, Jeff Clark and Nick Franchek. But a lot of people to thank, so thank you very much.